Hey everyone, welcome back to Contractor Growth Network. This is Logan Schinholster, and today I have an awesome guest that I've been wanting to talk to for a long time. I first heard him speak uh, about probably eight or nine months ago on uh, one of Tom Reber's contractor fight uh, webinars, but he is a contractor, business coach, author of two best-selling books, and international keynote speaker for the construction industry, Sean Van Dyke. Welcome. How are you today? Hey, Logan, thanks for having me on, man. I'm doing awesome. And I have to preface that international keynote speaker. Like mm -hmm. I'm getting ready to go to Mexico next month and and um, and do uh, a couple of talks for uh, some uh, construction groups down there. And um, before it was just a national speaker. But now I get to cross the border and say, yay, international. I figured I figured it would probably happen in Canada first. I was like, man, if I could yeah. just get one <laughs> speaking job just across the border, I can say international. Um, so for anybody that's listening out there and say, oh, international, he's pretty fancy. It's not really that fancy. We're running down to a resort in Mexico and spending a week <laughs> and doing some uh, some speaking while I'm down there. So that's well, that's but, that. Part. But, man, thanks for having me on. Yeah, dude. And, and by the time this thing comes out, it'll uh, it'll be international officially. But I'm yeah, that's right. in the same boat. I, we did a website for somebody up in uh, up in Toronto, and I'm now an international marketing agency. So. I know. I love I love our our northern brothers and sisters up in Canada because they give us so much clout. Oh yeah. Yep. Exactly. So, well, Sean, I appreciate you coming on. I first heard you do um, Tom's Fight Night, Tom Reaper's Fight Night, back. I guess it was what last May or June. At this yeah, point? We, yeah, we were we were actually on vacation. I was in Florida, and we had kind of set it up in our condo that we were staying at. And uh, I remember that it the, to see the the back end of that. I had the computer propped up on the end of the bed. I had taken some lamps and <laughs> lights to try to get you know make the video look a little bit better or whatever. Uh, but that would have been yeah, we would have been at the beach, so it would have been about the it was definitely in the summertime, so probably June. Yeah, so I remember. Uh, watching that and then i went out read your book or listened to your book i've listened to um profit first by michalowicz as well so it was good to hear how you spin it and how you bring your background to it so i thought that was fantastic and i was like you know what i need to interview this guy so i'm glad you joined me and and speaking of the background can you kind of i'm sure everybody at this point who's listening to this they've heard of you or they've read your book but can you give us a background into who is Sean Van Dyke and how'd you get here? Yeah, sure. So way back when I got a couple of degrees in engineering, uh, in civil engineering, I got my master's in structural engineering, went out and did the engineering thing for a while. And then uh, was was realizing that I didn't know how to build anything. And uh, so I got out of engineering and went to work for a large commercial uh, contractor. Um, on large, like my, one of my first projects was a post-tension concrete structure. And they wanted me on the project management team because I had my master's in structural engineering. So can kind of help out with the quality control on something that's uh, that specifically structurally designed. So love that. It put me out in the field. And for the first time, I really got to see how things actually got built. As an engineer, I could designed them and knew how to read the set of plans and all of that kind of stuff. But watching all of the trades work together out in the field, I was just, it was like, a, I was like a kid in a candy store. So love that. So I did that for a few years that led me to working for a, um, uh, an architecture firm that specialized in uh, real commercial real estate development. I uh, did civil engineering for them for a while. And then I went to work for a real estate developer as a construction manager and then I traveled mainly the Southeast, but kind of all Southeast and Midwest, working for a real estate developer, building, you know, pretty, the pretty typical uh, retail, commercial retail development, you know, big box stores with developing the outlots, the shops and, you know, the Walmarts, the Home Depots, mm -hmm. the Lowe's, all of that, uh, Targets, all of that kind of stuff. Um, this, by this time, we had probably two kids. We have five now. So <laughs> this is a long time ago, but we have two, we had two kids. And I mean, I was on the road three, three days a week because, you know, you got to as the construction manager, you got to go out to wherever the project mm -hmm. is. And my wife was like, I'm, I'm glad that you're enjoying your job, but this is not going to work out so well, you know, with two kids at home. So I uh, quit that job and started my first business as a real uh, real estate development and construction management business. I'm here in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I spent several years. That was my first business doing construction management and re, uh, uh, real estate development. 
for what I call sm small mom and pop shops. You know, somebody that had run a business for 20 years and leased a building and now they wanted to buy their own property and develop their not only the, build their own building, but then, you know, some extra warehouse space and an office building on the lot. And they thought they had it all together. And I was like, no, you're you're in the real estate <laughs> development game. Yeah. It's a different sort of thing. Um, so I did that locally around the East Tennessee area, which uh, cut back on my travel a lot and uh, did that for several years. Then in about 2008, uh, was on a I was on a large project managing. Gosh, it was probably a 300 acre site, and uh, the developer had put 27 million dollars into the infrastructure on this large uh, commercial site. And literally one day, I was the, the construction manager for that project. And literally one day, they called up and they said, "That's it. We're, we got no money. Banks aren't going to let. Banks won't give us any money." And this was. This was right before the residential market, about a year before the residential market. Really, what everybody knows is the downturn. It hit the commercial market first. So I was like, oh boy, I got to go out and do something else now. And so I made a pivot and started a construction company, a residential remodeling company, um, and did that for a while, for several years. And then one of my subcontractors, my trim and millwork subcontractor, a very good friend of mine, young guy, we started our businesses about the same time. He took me to lunch one day and he said, man, um, I got some problems. I'm, my business is getting ready to blow up. We got all this work coming in. And he had about six guys at the time. He was like, but I can't run a business. Like I, he was like, I, I just realized I suck at running a business. I'm really good at training carpenters and putting high end work in place. But the business side, I'm really suffering. And I said, yeah, you suck at running a business because he was one of my subcontractors. Yeah. I was always like, hey, you're like he would send me invoices for other contractors. And I'm like, dude, I'm not paying this because this is not me. Like, you got to get your paperwork in line. Anyway, at that lunch, he, he asked me a question that kind of changed the trajectory of my career. He said, um, he goes, would it be unwise of me to just hire somebody to come in and run the business? He goes, I don't think that I can. I don't think that I want to run the business. I want to run the guys. I want to run the work. And I, and I said, yeah, people do it all the time. They're called CEOs or CFOs or COO, you know, whatever. Hire somebody to do the business and they don't have to know anything about construction if they know the business side of it. And he said, man, that sounds so great. Why don't you do it? And I, and I was like, oh, I didn't, you know, I just told the guy that he sucked at business and I yeah. agreed with him. And then he was like, uh, it, but I was like, hey, I got my own company. I got my own thing going on. Um, and he was a really, really good salesman. And he sold me and he said, listen, your small little remodeling company that you've got, it's going to take 20 years to get to the level of the projects that we're on. And he was already in high end residential stuff in our area. And that I was just like, you know what? This is this seems interesting. He said, I got six guys. I'm going to need 12 guys in three months. And then from there, we're going to need even more guys. That's the pace that we're at what, at what we're growing. He said, do you want to be a part of that or do you want to stay small? And I thought son of a gun just called me out, you know? Yeah, and so I said, way, yeah. I told him, I said, all right, the only way that I'm going to do this, the only way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to run the company. You run the field, I'm going to run the business and you got to turn it all over to me. And he literally reached into his bag. He pulled out a, a manila folder with a whole bunch of paperwork and said, here's the business. He slid it across the table and said, oh. you, can, you can have it. You do the business <laughs> stuff. And then I, I looked at, it was absolutely, absolute mess. Um, and so I came on as COO, um, uh, chief operating officer for that trim and millwork company. And it was a whirlwind, but in eight, within 18 months, we went from six guys to about 18 to 20 guys, got the, got the business out of debt, got them making money. And that's when I realized that the systems that I had built from the real estate and construction management business, and that I had done in my contracting business were scalable. I didn't go to business school. I didn't, I, I don't know that I went out and took any course or class. I think just from the, my engineering background, I was always a numbers guy and a systems guy. And I just kind of put, built things in place that served me. And then when I went to work for the trim and millwork company, I realized that these systems apply for any business. They're just good. They're just good systems. And then as I looked around more, I was like, oh, I didn't invent any of this stuff. It's just tracking mm -hmm. the numbers and knowing what to do with the numbers and building systems and then pouring into people. So um, I, I worked there at the Trim and Millwork Company as their COO for about four years and then got a crazy idea to say, hey, I think that I can, what I've done for this company, 
I might be able to take and do for other construction business owners as well. Wrote a book, put it out there, gave it away for free. And that's kind of what started the whole thing. Jumped on Instagram and started saying, hey, you know, do you have some problems in your construction business? I might be able to help. And then mm -hmm. that was that was a little over three years ago. So that's that's kind of how we got got to here. So for you to step into a company, you said you're always a numbers guy and actually get them from six to 18 guys. Are you like you ever done a disc assessment where you figured out what like your personality traits are and what your strengths are? Yeah, I don't. I haven't done disc. Um, okay. The ones that I use and that I actually uh, train my clients on using in their hiring process and through their leadership and management um, uh, programs that we take them through is I like uh, usually start off with Myers Briggs. Okay. And so that's you know, but no, the the difficult thing about Myers Briggs, if anybody's familiar with it, you know, is the four letters. Um, and I'm an ENTJ, but it's hard to remember what those four letters actually mean and all of that kind right. of stuff. Um, so I also am certified in um, five uh, five voices training, and it's based on Myers Briggs. So I really like Myers Briggs, um, uh, but five five voices really simplifies Myers Briggs, and especially in a team environment. So I'm a mm -hmm. five voices person, but I've also certified in a uh, Strengths Finder. So for people that are familiar with um, Clifton, the Clifton Strengths Finders, I use that uh, for myself and for the teams. And then recently, um, on a personal level, but it applies to business too, is uh, Enneagram. I think that the Enneagram um, is very insightful for personality types. But so to answer your original question, I'm not a I'm not a disc guy because I've used these other ones that I found so impactful. And at a certain point, you just have to say, okay, I don't want to go. I don't yeah, need to learn another one. Yeah. I'm just using what works. So I'm I, I like uh, Five Voices, uh, Strengths Finders, and the Enneagram. But great question. It it certainly is so important. And and the reason that I ask is because the more business owners and contractors that I work with, the more I realize that. They're like me, where they're a a high DI, which is very energetic, go go go, and we all suck at the systems, the processes, looking at the numbers, this and that. So I'm curious if you are naturally more on the what they would consider SC side of things in DISC, which is empathetic slash analytical, or are you also this go 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 activator, but you just figured it out early on. Well, I'll, I'll tell you again. I don't. I don't know the different letters. Uh -huh. um, one thing that I struggle with being a systems guy and a numbers guy is I have had to work on empathy, okay. like making Same. making a connection. But because I've owned businesses, uh, several different businesses, they've gone through ups and downs and have various various successes and failures. When you own a business, you have to learn to sell. Somebody's mm -hmm. got to sell. And if you don't learn how to make an empathetic connection with a person, then you're not going to your your sales aren't going to be where they are. So what I would say is I've had to learn how mm -hmm. to be empathetic, which means I have to talk less, listen more and ask more questions because I'm a systems guy. Give me the numbers. I'll tell you what's right. I'm very binary in my thinking. And sometimes that can uh, overrun people. It was it was very good in my role as COO, but I've realized looking back now that I could I should have learned the skills of emp you know an empathetic connection, especially for sales. And once I learned that, then I realized like oh that's why that's part maybe part of the reason uh, of the success of the business that I have now is mm -hmm. it doesn't come naturally to me. And so your question was like. You know, did did you learn that? Did you develop that? Yeah, I think we all have natural ways that we're programmed. But when we realize that maybe the role that I'm in, so being a COO, that just hits all my sweet spots, right? Mm -hmm. But then also in the role of being a leader in a company too, if you just bombard people with data and systems and logic and you never ask somebody, hey, man, how's it going? How's your family doing today? Like, mm -hmm. I know that your oldest kid is, I don't know, trying out for that volleyball scholarship. Like, you got to ask those questions as a leader in the, you know, in a company, if you want to have a really good culture and you want people to like be be loyal. That was a skill that I had to learn. So mm -hmm. I'm real, whatever the letters are on high on mm -hmm. analytics and history and data, 
Mm-hmm. That is my natural tendency. Uh, my my wife describes it as like if you've seen the movie A Beautiful Mind, you know, John yeah, Nash, yeah, yeah. you go yeah. into the room and there's all of the lines and it's like he understands it. It's chaos to everybody else. Like I can sit down in front of a give me a spreadsheet full of data and mm-hmm. I will walk out 12 hours later and find the pattern in the chaos. And that energizes me when I'm uh, when I'm having to you know lead people in a certain way or or work on development or growth. It's just not my nat- natural tendency. So five hours of leadership training sometimes can drain me because it's just mm-hmm. not a natural place that I come from. Um, and so that's kind of the way I look at it saying, hey, I know how to do this now. I've learned these skills, but I'm aware that this is going to be draining as opposed to like, sure. give me numbers. Let me build a system. Give me a spreadsheet. 12 hours later, I'll actually walk out of there with more energy because that's just the way that I'm programmed. So for you then, because I think most business owners, especially like at least the ones that I know, we're all, we're not numbers people. So in your opinion, is it better to try to figure out the numbers, figure out the systems, figure out all that stuff, or do what the guy did that your buddy that approached you and just hire somebody, hire somebody who not only loves numbers and knows them, but this like energizes them. So yeah, is there I, like like a balance on that on, on which way to go? No, there I don't think that there's a there's a, a direct answer to that question. I think that mm-hmm. I think the answer is you have to be self-aware. Mm-hmm. Meaning, hey, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm not a systems guy, but I need numbers and systems. So, I need to dig in and figure it out and it's not a a place that I that I'm naturally programmed to, so it's going to take me longer. I'm going to be more frustrated and I'm probably going to make more mistakes. If I'm aware of that, okay, it's no problem. Like the reason that that I'm struggling with this is because it doesn't come from a natural tendency. So don't beat yourself up Mm -hmm. Uh, as opposed to somebody that's like because, you know, business owners, you can't do it. You you know, we can't do it all, even from a numbers perspective. And a, and, a, and a systems perspective, that's only one aspect of running the business. So I have to be very aware of the people in my company that might be forward facing. They need to make up for my, you know, for my weaknesses. So I need to hire mm-hmm. somebody. Like I have an operations manager. Um, she lives in California. And when we do live events, she's the one that works the room, not me. She makes mm-hmm. sure because she is so aware. And my wife also works for me too. She's my chief of staff. So the combination of these two people together at like a live event, they are connecting with people in the audience and sensing their needs where I'm just like, just here's the math, do the math. Yeah. And that, do it. yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I'm not even aware that they're where they're struggling. They sense that. How do they do that? I have no idea because it's just naturally the way that they're wired. So mm-hmm. I think um, the key to it is just being self-aware. If you're good at systems, if you're good at numbers, um, you might be that rare person that's good at good at systems and numbers and also connects with people. You There's a gap somewhere else, wherever that gap is. Just mm-hmm. be aware when you have to fill that gap, especially when you're growing a business and you're wearing 17 different hats, that thing is going to suck the energy out of you. You're not doing anything wrong. It's just it's not your natural tendency and it doesn't energize you. So like my friend that hired me, um, he was just very aware and came to that realization pretty quickly as a young guy. I mean, at that time, he was he was under 30. He was probably 28. And for someone to say, you know what? I suck at business. It's not my strength. And I need to I need to release those reins to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, you'll get that wherever you want to be. You'll get there faster if you're self-aware. So speaking of, of self-aware, in, in Profit for, for Contractors, you talk all about the craftsman cycle. And it seems that most people that are in this craftsman cycle have no idea until they finally go, oh crap, I'm I'm in the cycle. So could you touch on, first off, what is the craftsman cycle? And second, how can you identify if you're actually stuck in it right now? Yeah, so that in my book, Profit First for Contractors, we identify what what I call the craftsman cycle, and what what I found in in my experience in in starting a construction business, and what in dealing with uh, clients, and even before I became a business coach, I found myself answering questions from other people in my network that were, you know, we're kind of, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't call it a mastermind group. Everybody has their friends that call them up and say, hey, what do you do? How do you price this? Or, you know, uh, do you have a contract for that? Or do you have a subcontractor that can do this or whatever? So answering those questions, I realized when I stepped back to write the book that there is this thing called the craftsman cycle. And it really the the way that you get sucked into it. Uh, there's two things that lead to it. Lack of time and guessing. So there's four phases of this cycle. And if uh, your listeners haven't heard about this before, sit down because you're about to get smacked in the face because I'm about to describe probably the the your life up until this point. Or if you're out of the craftsman cycle, you will remember these days being like, yep, that was the first seven years of our business. Here are the four phases. It is price work, get work, produce work, find work. So it starts off when most of us have started construction businesses. We we were working somewhere else before and we said, Hey, I'm going to go, I had, I'm going to go work for myself. And let's say that you were making, I don't know, 30 bucks an hour and you say, now I'm in business for myself. And I know that my boss charges my, my time out at, I don't know, 50 bucks an hour, 60 bucks an hour, whatever it is. And so you think, oh, I can, I can make some more money. I'll, I'll charge myself out at $50 an hour. And so what happens is you go out and you start getting, you know, you start pricing work. And it starts as side jobs or whatever. It starts out small. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. This is where everybody starts. But you're guessing at what your price should be. And for most construction business owners, they start out and they, they produce great work. So what happens, and I'll ask you this, what happens when you do really high quality work for a really low price? You have to start finding money elsewhere. No, no, no. What I'm saying is you produce high quality work and you're not charging a lot for oh, it. Oh you get a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we go out, we price work, and then a few weeks later, a few months later, we turn around, we're like, I got all this work. Look at all this money. It's more money than I've ever made or ever had. And you start- I'm booked out three years, I'm, yeah. I'm booked out a year. Look at this. Yeah. I just started a bit. What's everybody complaining about? Like, business is awesome. I know I got to hustle and grind and do all that bull crap, right? But that's what it is. And woohoo, I'm making money. So it starts off with pricing work, and you're probably pricing your work too low. Then what happens is you get all of that work and you're you're excited. That's the second phase. You price work based on a guess uh, mm -hmm. and you think it's great. Now you get the work. That's awesome. Now you're booked up. Now your time is gone because you're 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 spending most of your time pricing more work and and talking to people and making sales. Now the third phase. Now you start producing the work. That's when your time is eliminated and the money is gone because now mm -hmm. you have to start spending money. And you realized I don't have enough money left to pay for this project. So what do I got to do? So I got to go the, yeah. four, the four cycle. I got to go find work. You have mm -hmm. no money. You have no time. And so the most important thing of calculating the numbers and understanding exactly what your costs are and what you should be charging. And when you figure that out, when you figure out what you should be charging, your clients are going to say no because they don't want to pay your higher price, but it's the only way to stay in business. So then you make desperate decisions and you go and find work. To You're really finding work to pay for the end of the current job that you're on. When you find that work, you go right back into the cycle, you price it, you're, and then you get it, and then you mm -hmm. produce it, and then the same thing happens again and again and again. So that is the craftsman cycle. Price work, get work, produce work, find work. And it's vicious. And it has to do with guessing at your numbers and the elimination of your time. But the way that you break out of that cycle is by saying no more that what I'm doing now is not producing a profit for me. You probably have to raise your prices. You probably need to delegate some work, hire some other people, get some systems in place. And you'll find that the word no can be one of the most profitable words in your business. Meaning when you figure out, wait a minute, I gotta, I've got to raise my prices by 20 or 30% in order to make a profit. That's just how the math works out. Mm -hmm. And then you go talk to a client and you price it correctly and they say, no, you're too high. You say, great, not a good fit for us. Mm -hmm. Get on to somebody else that will pay your price. And that gets into like, you have to learn how to sell. You have to learn how to sell. And that's a struggle for a lot of construction business owners because they spent years making people happy. The reason, and you have to understand, the reason 
that your clients are so happy, they don't even realize why they're happy. They're happy because you do really great work. You work 80 hours a week and you don't charge nearly enough for the value that you provide. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're going to be happy. You're a miserable wreck, <laughs> but your clients are happy. But then eventually yeah. you can't, it's not sustainable. And everybody out there knows you start putting off clients, you start delaying projects and you're chasing money. And the whole time you're scared of someone saying no because you want to make people happy. But when you have the systems and the math behind you, and the it really is a confidence thing. Hey, you don't want to pay my price? It's not a problem. We can't work for you because mm -hmm. I can't go out of business working for you. So somebody out there that's listening right now that they go, all right, I'm in this cycle. I, I realize it now. What is the first step for them? I know you said raise your prices, but like I hear some people go, you know, I raise my prices instead of charging 5,000. Now I charge 5,200 but they're still in the red on every project. So what would you say is a good first step to actually getting out of the cycle? Yeah, you have to you have to know your numbers. Okay. Like you have to, you can't guess anymore because guessing um, is not going to solve the problem. And when you've got the, like I said, when you have the confidence of math behind you, mm -hmm. it's so much easier to walk away to say no or at least make the decisions that you need to make. Listen, you're on a path. You're on a race to the bottom if you're competing on your price. You got to you got to know your numbers and, and determine how to sell your value. And I tell my clients this all the time. Like you have to what got you here is not going to get you to the next level. And if you've never made any money, then you got to do something. You have to do something different. So the math is the math. And that's the great thing about the math of your business. It will never change. Everything else in your business will change. Market mm -hmm. conditions, uh, materials, building science, uh, all of these things that are outside of your control. But the math of your business will never change. When you can have confidence in that, then that's what starts breaking, breaking you out of the craftsman cycle. But the easiest way, the simplest way to do that, and I talk about this in the book, and in fact, it's like the first action item that we say in the in the first chapter, is you go set up a bank account, call it profit, and what whatever amount of money is in your bank account right now, you take 1% and put it in your profit account. Don't touch it. You're not going to miss it because it's just 1%. If, mm -hmm. you know, if that, if that is $1,000 in your bank account, we're talking about 10 bucks. You're not, you can, you can, you, you'll survive off of $990. If it's $100,000, we're talking about $1,000, 1%. It's so small, you're not going to miss it, but it starts that habit. You might not know anything about your numbers. You still may be guessing, but you make this small little step, put that money aside, don't touch it, and it will be there mm -hmm. at the end of the quarter, at the end of the, at the end of the year. And for some people listening out there, if they'll do that, one or 2%, don't touch it. Every check that comes in, just siphon off one or two percent, put in that bank account. That's probably the most profitable you've ever been, even at one or two percent. Do you do you think that this whole craftsman cycle, this is just the construction industry that falls into this boat? Or do you think there's other businesses out there that are kind of playing the same game, always trying to, you know, sell more work just to make up for the stuff that they've already got in production right now? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, the craftsman cycle is representative of a lot of other um, entrepreneurial type businesses and other mm -hmm. business owners. I'm sure they have their own struggle. Um, sure. I, I, I think that uh, the craftsman cycle is unique in our industry in the fact that that contractors are expected to work for free. And what I mean by that is when when you call up your mechanic, let's say, for example, you call up your mechanic mm -hmm. and you say, hey, my car is broken down or it's having some problems. I don't know what's wrong with it. Can you fix it? And they say, yeah, bring it on in the shop. We'll take a look at it. You drop it off there. And uh, the next day, the mechanic calls you back and says, by the way, Logan, we figured it out. You got a leak in the radiator. Um, one of your belts is slipping. And because we're such good professionals, um, and we can tell you, you know, you drive this car pretty hard. We check the brakes, your brakes are shot and you need an oil change. Because mm -hmm. we're professionals. We looked at more than just the problem you said you thought you had. Mm -hmm. And all of that stuff is going to cost you $800 to fix. You want us to fix it. And you say, you know, you know what? I've, I've watched some YouTube videos and, and, uh, thanks for the diagnostic. <laughs> and, uh, I got a buddy of mine that's got some tools. And um, I think if you'll just give me the information, I'll go buy my own belt. And you know what? I'll do it myself. And the mechanic mm -hmm. will say, sure, no problem. 
come up, come down here and pick up your piece of crap, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can say that, but you go down to the shop and before he hands you the keys, he's going to hand you an invoice for $95 for yep. the diagnostic work. Yep. And you are going to pay it every time and you'll be happy about it. You're not going to argue because he provided you with a professional service. But for some reason, contractors are supposed to go out to your house, diagnose all of your problems, give you their solutions, write it up into a detailed scope of work, break out their labor and material costs and provide that to you, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, so that you can make an informed decision about whether or not you're going to hire them or not. That is unique in the construction industry and no one else has to do that. You How pay do you think for that professional services. How did that start? Do you think that was just like a hundred years ago, they just started doing like free estimates and free bids and it's just over time that's been like the culture around it? Gosh, that's a great question. Like where did the free estimate or where did the free work start? Um, yeah, like the mechanics, I'm sure there was a couple of mechanics out there that probably did free, you know, like would diagnose your car for free, but that didn't catch on. Yeah, I don't, that's a great question. I don't, I don't, I don't know where it started, um, but, I think that I think that the the problem is the word estimate mm -hmm. is defining what that is. So so people say, oh, Sean, you never give a free estimate. No, I, I get free estimates all the time. Tell me about your project. And if I'm a professional, then um, then I should be able to tell you what your project costs. Now, if I am a custom home builder and I do, you know, two million to four million dollar homes and you're calling me for a kitchen remodel. I, I probably it's going to I'm going to struggle to give you an estimate because that's I, that's not specifically the work that we do. Can we remodel your kitchen? But it's probably not a good fit for us if we do this other this other kind of work. Um, but I should be able, if I'm a professional, be able to tell you based on what you tell me mm -hmm. what things should cost. And there's there's something out out there that says, you know, you're supposed to get three bids. Well, you don't get three bids on, you know, you don't, you don't go into a restaurant and say, you know, give me three different, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to visit three different restaurants and I'm going to decide. No, they got a menu right there with the prices right there. So I'm saying for contractors, you got to develop your own menu of prices. I'm not saying you publish it, although that might not be a bad idea, but you got to be specific in, in what your niche is. So I think part of the problem with that is in the, in the name of the business itself, we're a general contractor. We're mm -hmm. general. We do this we do that we do the other thing we'll do anything and it's very hard to determine your standard pricing when everybody that calls is always asking for something different and because you're caught in the craftsman cycle you're just pricing work we got to keep the money coming in and so you're scared to tell someone no where it all started i have no idea but mm -hmm. it's uh it's it's an epidemic in our in our industry when if you look at other businesses like they don't do that. Professionals charge for their work. So I want to help a lot of contractors say, give free estimates. Meaning when someone calls you up, say, tell me about your project. What mm -hmm. is it? Oh, that in general, because we're professionals, is usually between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars. That is a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand. I don't know what it is, you know, whatever it they describe, but then you got to say, Well, what's your budget? Sure. Because like if you describe a hundred thousand dollar project, but you only have fifty thousand dollars to do it, you're 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 in a you're in a race to lose a lot of money because there is a contractor out there that mm -hmm. will say he can do it, he or she can do it for fifty thousand dollars, but you won't get the project that you described. So the best thing for you to do is just to tell me what your budget is, and if it truly is fifty thousand dollars, then I can, because I'm a professional, I can help you plan. A fifty thousand dollar budget, but you got to make some you got to make some decisions to eliminate the hundred thousand dollar project you described. And so there's a difference between an estimate and a proposal. An estimate is a guess based on an experience. And if you're not good at guessing, then you need some more experience. But eventually, you should be able to say, "Hey, this is what we do, mm -hmm. and I'm confident in our pricing, so I can give you a range." Now, in order for us to do any professional services, come out prepare a scope of work, take measurements and do the whole process, that's a professional service and you pay for it just like you would anybody else, just like the mechanic, just like your doctor. So do you do you remove like the word estimate from your vocabulary? Like are you only doing proposals and like 
I guess, like consultative fees? Like, like how do you approach that? No, I, I, I would say, hey, when someone calls up, hey, tell me mm-hmm. about your project. And then they're mm-hmm. going to tell you about the project. This is all part of the sales process. And mm-hmm. then you eventually get to, hey, well, what's your budget? Mm-hmm. Well, we don't, you know, and you're going to get one of three answers. We don't have a budget or they do have a budget and it's going to be too low. Mm-hmm. Or they say, well, we don't really have a budget. And they're going to say it in a way that is what they're saying is, well, price really doesn't matter because we just want somebody that we can trust. So one of those three answers are going to come up. So the one that's most typical, oh, we don't really have a budget. Oh, no problem. You just described the project to me. In my professional opinion, your budget should be this. Mm -hmm. And then you say, are you prepared to spend that? Customers will always say, oh, uh, no, we're not going to spend that. And that's why I say contractors, you've got to listen to this. Two seconds ago, they didn't have a budget. You gave them a number or a range, and now they say we're not going to spend that. Guess what? They just told you what the budget wasn't. They Mm -hmm. do have a budget. They're not lying. They're just scared. Everybody that calls you up is scared to give you a number. Now, if you have built a reputation and you've done the right marketing, you've done the right like pre-framing, all of that good, you know, that you teach, all of that good stuff to warm up a client. Then when you ask the budget question to someone that knows I'm going to spend 200 grand with this contractor because I've seen their work, I've heard testimonials about their clients talking about the experience. I don't know what the I don't know what the number is, but I'm prepared to go through their process and we're prepared to pay whatever we're actually prepared to pay top dollar for this thing because of this person's reputation. And when they when they when people buy from you based on your reputation, you have to understand what they're buying from you is the marketing. No mm-hmm. one buys a product or service. Everybody buys your marketing. Mm-hmm. It's just the product or service is the result of proper yeah. marketing. So your original question, do I eliminate estimates from my vocabulary? No. When I have the budget question and they say, oh, we don't have a budget. Okay, here's what your budget should be. Are you going to do that? Uh, are you going to spend that? And they say, no. Then you figure out what the budget is pretty quick. And you say, okay, in order for us to get started, we're going to come out and do a our pre-construction process, you need to walk them through that. And we're going to charge a thousand bucks, 5,000 bucks, what, you know, whatever that is for your company. Then people are going to say, oh, you're going to, you're going to charge me to do an estimate. You go, oh, no, I just gave you an estimate based on what you described. And you said you didn't want to spend that. So now we're working on developing the budget. The only way we can develop the budget is for us to provide you with some professional services. And we charge for those professional services. And those professional services are part of the, the, cost of the construction project, but we don't know what the construction project is yet. So we're just charging you for the professional services up front. And if you pay for those and we're successful and deliver this, then whatever the construction costs are, we will, and there's a couple of different ways you can do it, but we'll credit that money towards the construction costs. Mm-hmm. That's how it works. And if I, anybody I like has a, that. yeah. Yeah, that, it's, that's a good yeah, it's it's good because you hear like, you know, well, we're like, because I know at the CSA, it's they talk about like um, consulting, you know, now we're consulting. But when you talk about, you know, we're charging for professional services, I think most, most everybody that's listening to this podcast, if, if I ask them, I say, what kind of clientele do you have? They always say middle to upper class. Like that's what everybody says out there. So the middle to upper class, they know what professional services is and the connotation behind that. They understand, like, oh, like this is like a lawyer, or a CPA, whatever it is. So they automatically will frame that in their mind as, oh, this is, you know, this is just the norm now. So that was cool how you you reframed it and restructured it to show them that it's not just an estimate. We're actually we're working with you to make this thing happen. Yeah, and 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 I get it. Like you got listeners out there saying, wow, I'd love to be able to do that, but no way, not in my area. Here's another thing. They're going to be saying no contractor around here does that. When whenever I hear that, when someone says no contractor around here does that, perfect opportunity for you to capitalize on differentiation, and you use that. Say you're going to charge us for an estimate. No, I'm not going to charge you for an estimate. I gave you an estimate. What we charge for is our professional services. Well, no mm-hmm. one charges for that. Well, how do you know? Well, we've had three other people come out here and they've given us numbers, and none of them charge us for that. And you say, oh, let's stop it right there. Three people have come out. You've described the project to them. You've, they've given you numbers. Let me ask you, why haven't you hired them? Mm-hmm. The only reason you haven't hired them is because you don't trust them. So 
So don't use a number that's made up from somebody you don't trust to try to get a number out of. I already gave you an estimate. Now to go forward, uh, you know, let's work per, with, in a professional relationship and we'll be able to deliver a wonderful experience. But some people are saying, nope, no contractors do that. Great. It's a great opportunity for you to be the one contractor that does. And trust me, it will elevate your clientele because you'll be known for that. Even if customers are like, who the hell do you think you are charging for that? When someone says that, they're inviting you into a conversation to describe why you're better. So when mm -hmm. someone says, who the hell do you think you are? No one charges for that. Well, thanks for asking. In fact, we, the re, who do we think we are? Well, we think we're better, but let me, let me tell you about the process. Sure. And you've got to have a you've got to have a process to walk them through that that delivers on the value. But for your listeners out there, I want you to think about yourself in those terms of the CPA, the the doctor, the attorney, the CEO, the CFO of those companies or that your ideal clients. You you got to see yourself at the on the same level as them. And so here's an example that, that I use a lot is to say, OK, imagine calling up your doctor. And saying, "Hey, Doc, I'm sick. Um, I need. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to come to my house on Saturday morning before the kids' soccer game because it's convenient for me. I need you to draw my blood. Then I want <laughs> you to take my blood back to your lab. I want you to run some tests. I want you to figure out what's wrong with me. I want you to write a prescription. Then I want you to deliver that prescription back to me at a time when it's convenient for me. Let's say in the evenings because that's when I'll be home." And I want you to present all that information to me and then give me a cost for what it's going to take to cure my sickness. And then I will decide if I'm going to pay you for that. No, no one does that. They call up their doctor and they say, hey, doc, I'm feeling bad. In fact, you're not even going to get to talk to the doctor. You're going to talk to the receptionist and they say, we have an appointment available at this time. And you go because you want that problem solved during the, their open appointment time. That gets into a whole other thing about how contractors can be seen you know as professionals when people say and i see this oh well we got to go meet with our the doctor the lawyer the whatever 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 after hours on weekends and getting into the craftsman cycle it's just sucking that time out of you and you have to understand like when that let's let's pick on attorneys because they're fun to pick on <laughs> let's pick on attorneys when that attorney when that attorney's child has a cavity what do they do? They take time off of their job. They take time off and they go during the day because that's when the other professional is open during office hours. Now, there are some, some dentists or some other service, service providers that if you have an emergency, guess what? You can go get emergency services after hours and you're going to pay quadruple the price. It's totally fine because they're selling convenience and emergency services. And contractors have to view themselves at that same level or they'll never break out of the craftsman cycle. Now, some people saying, well, Sean, we got to meet with our homeowners when they're there. Yeah, sure you do. But most of them are just going to want you to meet with them evenings and weekends. And that's your family time. That's your time, too. And you got to realize that they do it for doctor's appointments. They do it for parent teacher conferences. They even do it for their oil changes. They go on their lunch break or take time off to meet with other professionals. And you're no different. I used to do that with um, with the contractors wanted to work together when I, when they would go, yeah, I'm just busy all day. Can you can you talk after eight o'clock tonight? And at first I'm like, you know what? I get it. You know, you're busy, understood, happy to do it. And I never sold a single job to somebody that wanted to meet at that time. So now it's I got nine to five. I, I work outside those hours as well. But if you can't take a half an hour to talk about the future of your company and your life, with me, yeah, it's not that not, important to you. Not that important. It's a it's yeah. a two on a scale of one to ten. So, it's kind of like that with homeowners, where you know this emergency home addition that has to happen, but they can only meet at eight o'clock at night when it's convenient for them. How much of an emergency is it really? Yeah, I, I'm, but I'm willing to go. I'm willing to go after hours or on weekends for the right customer. Not everybody is your right customer. That's why you got to pre-qualify them. But mm -hmm. when that person calls up. And they, it starts with, hey, how'd you hear about us? When they were referred from another good customer, right? And that other customer, you took them through that experience, that process where you charged them up front to do the proposal and the professional services. Mm -hmm. They told their friend, hey, this is the process. That person calls in 
and it's a bigger project than you've ever done before. And it's with a de the right designer, the right architect, the right neighborhood. It's the right whatever. It's that. Guess what? You better believe I will be there. Hell, I'll bring you dinner. How about mm -hmm. that? But I'm going to be very upfront about it, saying normally we don't we don't do this without charging for it. But we're excited to work for you. We want this job. So I'm not going to charge you what I normally charge people because we're going to give you the first part of this for free. And that is called marketing. I'm going to market to the right customers, but I'm still going to pre-frame them with, hey, normally we charge $5,000 for our pre-construction services. Tell you what, let's take you for, through the first phase of our three-part pre-construction services. We won't charge you anything for that because I want to earn your business. And I'm going to tell them this is the right project. This is the right designer. We've been trying to get into this neighborhood. And trust me, we are going to blow you away because we, when we're done with this, we want to make you our number one salesperson. So let's just be really clear. Normally, we charge for this. We have a process. And at the end of this, we're going to make you our number one salesperson because we're going to get testimonials. We're going to take pictures. And hell, I'm even going to put you on video because mm -hmm. that's going to sell the next, the next job in this neighborhood with this designer doing this thing that's how that's how you get out of the craftsman cycle so for me and i know we have other stuff to talk about but we can sure. we can skip that just because now you're speaking my language yeah, yeah all the video stuff so you're very big on video um i do i mean we have a lot we do three videos a week we have so many other pieces of content um what got you over the hump of putting your face on camera because a lot of, even I have clients that I had to talk one down yesterday from the ledge of just going, look, man, we've been talking about doing video for two years now and you haven't done anything. And he said, Logan, like what, what gets other clients over the edge? And I was like, honestly, I just kind of have to like put a shoe in their butt and just say, you know, you can either have the pain of being a little bit embarrassed, but only you're going to be embarrassed or you're eventually going to go out of business because everybody else that's doing video will surpass you. So for you, Sean, you're big on it. You're, you walk around the airport talking. What got you <laughs> over that? If there even was some sort of hesitation, what got you over that? Uh, well, you know, this kind of circles back to what we started talking on because I excel mm -hmm. at, uh, at being apathetic, not empathetic, mm -hmm. but apathetic. I don't care what people think. I really don't. And what, what, was a key for me was realizing people if you are delivering valuable content something that someone can walk away with and say huh maybe that maybe i can use that um then then when you know you're providing value however you look however you sound just goes away because you know that that people are getting valuable information from it and people will will act on valuable information now they'll act in different ways they'll comment they'll like they'll share they'll come back to you they'll sign up for your email they'll they'll repost they'll do you know all of these sorts of things and when you get that when you realize like i think so much so so many people are concerned about how they look how they sound um and they're not focused on what does whoever you're trying to reach what does that audience want to hear what's the most valuable piece uh, of content or va valuable piece of information. If you'll focus on that, no, and just trust in that, no one cares what you look like. No one cares mm -hmm. what you sound like. If the content is valuable and someone can go and do something with it. Um, and for, so for me, it was easy because I don't, I didn't care. I had this idea, like, I think I've got, I see a gap in the in the industry i think i can fill that with some valuable information and it's going to require me to turn the my cell phone around on myself and do some wacky yeah i wasn't being wacky for the sake of being wacky but it, you know mm -hmm. i thought it was kind of wacky but then when i realized like people need the information that was all the fuel that i needed so i got over it i got over it pretty quickly hey if you're not comfortable on camera don't worry you do 100 takes that's what everybody that's what everybody does. Mm -hmm. But if you're not comfortable on camera, here's another thing too, is no one really cares about you. Get your clients to say some good stuff. Put them on camera. Now, you got to set that up. You pull out a camera, you pull out a cell phone camera and say, hey, can I put you on camera? People scatter, right? They don't want to, 
they don't they don't mm -hmm. so if you pr prep them for that saying hey by the way love to swing by when we check on the job are you going to be there um just just want to let you know would love to get i'm not going to put your face on camera or a close up but i need some video of my customers like you cuz you guys are awesome but if i could just get some some video of you guys on camera and then let me just turn my cell phone on here and do an audio recording so people can hear your voice and we're just going to have like you and I are having right now let's just have a conversation about the project and you just talk to me don't i'll be recording it you know i mean there's laws you got to make sure you, you know you let people know they're being recorded or whatever but video doesn't always have to be you right so it it makes sense for my business because i am providing information business information to contractors um, but as much as I can, and you see this on my content, if, if people follow that, you'll see snippets of me in a coaching session with my clients. So you see, oh, I see people like me. I hear uh, people like me asking questions that I have. And so it makes that that connection in a different way. So video is everything, by the way. It's it is everything now. I mean, there's there's SEO, there's all of that other kind of stuff, but e video is so easy to consume. And that's just what, I mean, you look at the, you look at TikTok now, I mean, video is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, yes. and it's just blowing up massively. Um, and so if you're not on video, you're missing out, you just get over yourself. No one cares what you look like. No one cares what you sound like, as long as you're providing valuable content uh, and valuable information. Now, I will say that lighting and sound does matter. Mm -hmm. don't worry about the high product there's there's studies that have shown that the shaky cell phone camera video is actually more engaging because our brains know that it's not highly produced so we don't think that we're being sold to and i love watching ads on facebook i click on them all the time to see how different people are doing it and you notice that a lot of ads on facebook that get a really high engagement are the ones that are not professionally done mm -hmm. but if people can't hear you that makes a difference. So grab a mic, make sure you're in a quiet place or it's not too echoey or whatever. Even if you're shooting with your cell phone, sound matters. And it, it sounds weird, like, especially when I'm like walking through the airport I'll, and you'll see it now and do it. I'm like, I wait until I get into a sunny part of the airport so people mm -hmm. can see your face. Because again, the sound is usually off on any kind of ad or any video to begin with. And it makes a difference if people can see a smiling face and they can see the whites of your eyes. It's just one of those things. And it's a little bit more engaging. So that's my yeah, little that, spiel on video. But yeah, you know the eyes are big, man. That's something that I like. If somebody ever sends me a video, like the client, I'm like, hey, they love it. Really appreciate you doing this. Can we do one more without sunglasses? Because there's a trust yeah. factor of the eyes. And that's why, like in the NFL, like you can't wear visors that are too dark because your eyes tell you where you're going. Yep. So it's there's a lot that goes into the eyes. So yeah, now well, when, cool, man. We're still like, on. When you're like Casey Neistat, you know, and that's like yeah, a brand. You can do it. Yeah, you can do it. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. You After you've made it. ten million dollars, you know, from a, from a video. And he has, and he talks about why he uses sunglasses too. So he like, and once you get that, now you go, oh, now it makes sense. But yeah. I I see that all the time where somebody will, and it's fine with the, you know no glasses, but like to look at yourself. In the camera, it looks like you got like a double lazy eye going on. So it's it's a lot of practice of knowing it, where exactly yeah. to look. So, yeah. Well, cool, man. Well, um, to wrap all this up, let me ask you, Sean, where can the listeners go to connect with you or learn more about everything you got going on? Because you're putting out some good vibes in the uh, the contracting industry. Yeah. So uh, my my website is seanvandyke.com. So that's S H A W N V A N D Y K E. Or you can just search me on Google and I, I better own I better own that first page on Google, but um, you can go you can go to my you can go to my website and if you want to get um, on my email list, you can download my book, uh, the paperwork punch list. It's totally free. Just go to seanvandyke.com slash the paperwork punch list and I'll send that uh, that book to you for free and then send you some other valuable content, some other information uh, to connect with me. I'm on Instagram at Sean Van Dyke, and then if you if you go on my website, then you can subscribe to my YouTube channel and then my uh, my book profit first for contractors you can get that on Amazon just search my name or profit first for contractors um, you'll see Mike McCallis says profit first it'll pop up there too um, and then you can go to profit first contractor.com profit first contractor 
www.thetabletop.com and you can download some free resources uh, as you get into the book, the tables and the figures. And then you can also plug your email address there, what I call the Profit First for Contractors bonus toolbox. And I will send you a free video training series on just how to get profit first for contractors set up and going in your business and um, yeah just you know connect with me on any of the social media channels i'm on linkedin too so uh, just search just google me and you'll find it yeah <laughs> well cool guys we'll put that in the show notes sean thank you very much man this was awesome logan thank you man anytime you want me back i'd love to come on this was awesome for sure thank you thank you